Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and our chats with Emily as we are calling our readings through the poetry of Emily Dickinson contained in the Johnson edition. We turn now to a little poem, 94, Angels in the Early Morning. Um, and we're back um, to the angels of poem 78. Um, and th it's interesting because Emily, it's not altogether clear what Emily thought about angels and the theological view of angels, but here she'll play a remarkable game, I think, with us, and we're going to want to pay attention to the idea of angels as being somewhat representative of her idea of hope, uh, as we'll hear about it when we meet hope is the thing with feathers later. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at learnstrong.net, down that left-hand side again, chats with Emily, our playlist. I'm hopeful that you've already studied our introductory set of comments and that you've been a part of our Proceed 93 poems and study. We just uh, uh, worked with, went up a year this evening. Now, it is interesting that Emily, in a letter of 1883, it's letter 1824, uh, I'm sorry, 824, actually wrote to her friend Maria Whitney the following, quote, the angel begins in the morning of every human life. Now, I, I love this idea when we read this poem, the, the notion of is she speaking literally about angels or is she speaking metaphorically about angels? Let's just enjoy. Angels in the early morning may be seen the dews among. Stooping, plucking, smiling, flying. Do the buds to them belong? Angels when the sun is hottest may be seen the sands among. Stooping, plucking, sighing, flying, parched the flowers they bear along. Now, Emily will mention seven times uh, already angels, and 15 more times after this, you'll remember it in poem 7, 18, 30, 49, 65, 73, and 78. Um, it isn't clear always if she's speaking specifically about the theological view, the Christian theological view of angels, or if she's talking more in kind of the abstract, that is to say maybe about hope or the ideals of hope. Notice she'll, st she'll speak metaphorically though about life as being first of all in the early morning uh, time, in youth we might say, angels are there, seeing the dews among, right, when life is very young, in other words children. Um, and then she'll say about these four things, the angels are stooping, they're plucking, they're smiling and they're flying. Now interestingly later it's going to not be smiling but sighing, which will make sense. Because she'll start with this rhetorical question, do the buds to them belong? I love this rhetorical question. In other words, are all children watched over by a guardian angel? And she seems to be suggesting the possibility of this. Then she'll come back to angels when the sun is hottest. So now we're no longer in the morning of our life, but rather in the challenging, someone maybe call it middle age of our life. Maybe seeing the sands among again stooping just like before, plucking just like before, only now again sighing and flying. In other words, when life gets really hard and everything is parched, parched the flowers they bear along, this will take us back um, uh, when, we, when we meet it, this will take us to poem uh, number 254. I mentioned it. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. The idea here at 2A, I think, is that there is always for Emily reason to believe in hope. Uh, this is going to be central. Uh, this is why so many people will say to me, hey, Emily's such a downer poet. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's so many poems that she writes, uh, a poem like this, where it appears as if she's making the argument that we're, we're protected in some way from our very youngest years all the way through our life when things get hard, hot, and parched, right? And to be, I love her use of the rhetorical question that she will then be able to suggest you know, if you look at your life, it does seem as if there is a certain kind of protection that has been afforded to each of us. At 3A, well, uh, I think Emily's readers would uh, identify quickly with the Matthew 4.11 passage, the devil left him and the angels came and ministered unto him. I think as well of T.S. Eliot's wasteland, if there were water and no rock. Notice the idea of parched. Now, my Emily group at 3B, my Emily group, pointed out that angels can often represent those that help us in our life instead of being specifically the theological notion of angels, but rather those who are uh, helpful to us in our lives. And that leads to an easy 3B question. Who are the angels of your life? And in what ways have you been an angel 
to some other person. And is it possible, of course, my Emily group would love to ask, that Emily is an angel. Thank you. <laughs>